Nigerian English and Schneider's dynamic model. Fresh considerations. Two important subjects feature in the title of this lecture. Nigerian English and Schneider's dynamic model. We shall consider each of them separately before doing so jointly as the title implies that we should. We first consider the dynamic model. The dynamic model is the invention of Professor Edgar Schneider of the University of Regensburg. It has been developed by him in several publications, most notably in his 2007 book Post-Colonial Englishes. More will be said below about the meaning of the book's title. For now, Schneider's set of post-colonial Englishes includes, but does not coincide with, the set of what, since about 1980, have been referred to as the New Englishes, Nordquist, 2020. Nigerian English is one of these. New Englishes appear under other names in other models. The most influential of these has been Brudge Catcher's Concentric Circles model, 1985, comprising inner circle, outer circle and expanding circle countries which correspond respectively to the ENL, English as a native language, ESL, English as a second language, and EFL, English as a foreign language, countries, of the earlier but still useful Peter Strevens model. New Englishes is thus equivalent to outer circle or ESL. Englishes. The two older models have increasingly been criticised and with good reason. Thus, in Nigeria and in other outer circle or ESL countries, there is an increasing number of people for whom English is the first language they learn and the language they know best. Udofot. 2010. Such Nigerians can be regarded as native speakers of English, who can also therefore be said to own the language. Uguani, 2021. The two models are static or synchronic in that they view varieties of English around the world as they are today. In contrast, Schneider calls his model dynamic and it is also diachronic because it describes and analyzes the historical and still continuing evolution of such varieties. Schneider defines post-colonial Englishes as varieties of English that have developed in parts of the world to which English was transplanted in the past as a result of the enterprise of a colonizing power or its citizens, this power in most cases being Britain. Jowett, 2022, makes the rather obvious point that the post-colonial Englishes of the model were already developing during the colonial era. New varieties of English thus began to develop in contact situations. In discussing their inception, Schneider draws on the work that has been done in this area by Thomason, 2001, and Mufwene, for example, 2001. Colonization was of different types, trade, plantation, settlement, and exploitation. While the first two 
led to the development of English lexified pidgins and creoles, the development of new varieties of standard English is associated with the latter too. An idea central to the model is the distinction between two strands, that of the settlers, the STL strand, and that of the indigenes, the IDG strand. Together and interacting, they make up a post-colonial English. Schneider maintains that the expression post-colonial English refers both to the ENL English of a country such as Australia and to the ESL English of a country such as India or Singapore or Nigeria. And that his model provides a unified account of all the worldwide varieties of English except that of Britain itself. Schneider's unified approach has nevertheless generated considerable controversy. Jewett, 2029-2022, questions the applicability of the model to Nigeria on the grounds that Nigeria, unlike other African countries such as Kenya, was never an area of white settlement. The same point is made by Detterding, 2008, in his review of Schneider's book. Dennis and Darcy, 2018, finding Schneider's title too broad in its reference, likewise insist on the radical difference between settler colonial Englishes, for example, Australian and Canadian, and post-colonial Englishes in a narrower sense, for example, Nigerian, Indian. The former, settler Englishes, is the English of a country where the settlers took over the land and whose descendants now constitute the majority of the population. The latter, post-colonial Englishes, in a narrower sense, is that of a country where settlers did not take over the land, or not permanently, and the population is today made up mostly of indigenes. Arguably, even the English of England itself is post-colonial in Schneider's sense, sharing features with the settler colonial Englishes of today. For in this, the fifth and 6th centuries AD, the Anglo-Saxons brought their language from northwest Germany to the land they later called England and eliminated or expelled or assimilated the Celtic in inhabitants and borrowed some Celtic words into English. Bohr and Cable, 1993. Likewise, American English is post-colonial, and Schneider devotes a chapter to showing convincingly how his model applies to it. The evolution of a new variety is said by Schneider to have four aspects or parameters, history and politics, identity construction, the sociolinguistics of contact, linguistic developments. Of these, the last is obviously the most important from a purely linguistic point of view, while the first is self-explanatory. Identity construction mainly concerns the way in which the settlers and the indigenes view themselves. Thus, the settlers initially feel that they still belong to the nation they came from, usually Britain. But later, they are conscious that they form, or with the indigenes, help to form a new nation. As an example of the 
sociolinguistics of contact, bilingualism in English and an indigenous language spreads among the indigens, less often among the settlers. Linguistic developments include borrowing into the evolving new variety from indigenous languages and the appearance of new linguistic forms. The evolution of each variety also passes through five historical stages or phases. In phase one, foundation, the settlers arrive and since they come from different parts of the home, com the home country, that is Britain, contact among them produces a blending of their different dialects, thus marking the beginning of a new variety. Contact between them and indigenes is limited and utilitarian. In phase two, exonormative stabilization, the English of the settlers is now learned by some indigenes, but it remains fundamentally tied to an external norm, norm, that is standard British English. It incorporates numerous lexical items borrowed from indigenous languages, especially names of flora and fauna and of cultural objects. In phase three, nativization, which, Schne which Schneider rightly terms the most interesting and important, the most vibrant phase, ties between the settlers and the mother country weaken. Knowledge of English becomes widespread among the indigenes. The local English is marked by intensive lexical borrowing from indigenous languages and also by variant phonological and morphosyntactic forms all representing the adaptation of English to the new environment, its nativization, domestication, etc. Another aspect of nativization is that a complaint tradition also develops, opposed to the development of the new local forms and seeking to outlaw them. In phase four, endonormative stabilization, the one-time colony has become an independent state. English is retained and retains, some, sometimes exclusively, the status it naturally had in the colonial era as the official language and principal lingua franca of its educated citizens. The citizens whether of settler or indigenous origin, regard the new variety of English that they speak as legitimate. And this variety possesses a new local norm which will, will be accepted as adequate in formal usage. Newbrook, 1997. Literary creativity in English also develops and dictionaries of the new variety are produced. The main feature of phase five differentiation is that the new variety is now so stable that sub-varieties of it emerge correlating with social and regional differences. Schneider recognizes that while he has created a model that has general application and validity in the English speaking world, its local manifestations vary considerably. One such manifestation is that in ESL countries, English is associated with a power wielding elite, so that aspiring to membership of this elite encourages the learning of English and the effort to attain mastery of it. 
In contrast, there is the pull of solidarity with the masses, which requires familiarity with a language that symbolizes their poverty and powerlessness. This may be a purely indigenous language, or Creole in the Caribbean, or Pidgin in West Africa. Schneider's point here is one example of the considerable applicability of his model to Nigeria. However, this ESL motivation to learn and master English has its parallel in ENL countries such as Britain, where, in the past at least, to belong to the ruling elite required the speaking of standard English with received pronunciation and speaking a regional dialect of English was a major handicap to joining the elite. Section two of the paper concerns Nigerian English. Later in this paper, Schneider's model will be more explicitly related to Nigerian English, but it is des desirable first and partly because of certain persistent misconceptions to form or reform an idea of what Nigerian English is, what constitutes it. Nigerian English is fundamentally different from Nigerian Pidgin English. As Nigerian scholars have been saying over a period of several decades, it is standard English that has become nativized, domesticated, etc. And I here quote Adegbija, 2004. Through English as used in Nigeria, having come to reflect Nigerian cultural realities and the needs and assumptions of Nigerian learners. Therefore, it contains many distinctively Nigerian forms. Henceforth, I call them DNFs. Some of them are also found in other ESL varieties, so they're not absolutely distinctively Nigerian forms necessarily. The expression Nigerian English can be or has been used to refer either more broadly to all aspects of English usage in Nigeria, excluding pidgin, or more narrowly to DNFs, distinctively Nigerian English forms. Henceforth, it is used mainly in the second sense. Nigerian English has undoubtedly been taking shape in the 180 years that have elapsed since 1842, when the first Christian missionaries set foot in the country <clears throat> and began to establish schools providing Western education. In this enterprise, the teaching of English inevitably played an increasingly important role, as employees were required for work in the various agencies, governmental, governmental or otherwise, that came into existence after the inception of colonial rule. This began with the British annexation of Lagos in 1861 and culminated in the proclamation of the protectorates of northern Nigeria and southern Nigeria in 1900. Schools have been the principal locale for the learning of English in Nigeria as in other ESL countries, almost certainly also for the development of Nigerian English. Relevant records, especially for the first hundred years, and even more, of the period concerned, either do not exist or have not yet been investigated. 
Major research in the area is waiting to be done. Chapter 5 in Jurit 2019 is a gesture in this direction. But a more recent example is the publication of a historical corpus of Nigerian English, Unwabona et al. 2022, made up of samples of Nigerian writing drawn from the post-independence era. Nigerian English scholars must hope that a corpus for the pre-independence decades will eventually be, cre be created as well. As time went on, DNFs, distinctively Nigerian forms, appeared one after another in all the language areas – phonology, morphosyntax, lexis, graphology – and they represent various linguistic strategies, namely borrowing, coinage, calking and semantic extension in lexis, mother tongue interference, especially in morphosyntax and phonology, generalization in morphosyntax and spelling, and spelling pronunciation in phonology. One DNF in the area of punctuation is that etc. etc. is commonly written e dot t dot c dot. DNFs are a feature of common usage, although the incidence of them varies from one user to another, a fact which has much bearing on the question of sub-varieties of Nigerian English, as explained below. Variety-specific forms, moreover, constitute a tiny part of the totality of forms making up any standard variety of English. A reflection of the fact that, despite all our understandable contemporary interest in variation, Standard varieties differ relatively little from one another in their morphosyntax, vocabulary and spelling. For this reason, it is a simple matter to locate a text that, though produced by a Nigerian, might have been produced by an exponent, by an exponent of the standard form of any other variety. For example, school in America was easy. Assignments sent in by email, classrooms air conditioned, professors willing to give make-up tests. But she was uncomfortable with what the professors called participation and didn't see why it should be part of the final grade. It merely made students talk and talk, class time wasted on obvious words, hollow words, sometimes meaningless words. This comes from page 134 of Americana, the third novel of the now world-famous Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, published in 2013. In it, there is no DNF to suggest that it was written by a Nigerian. As a written text, it could also help to confirm that the distinctiveness we look for is found more in the spoken usage of educated Nigerians than in their written usage. This fact should compel us to exercise caution in looking for examples of DNFs in Nigerian literature in English, as Jurit 2022 points out. Although Nigerian novels written in English supply examples of Nigerian English, along with indigenous language and pidgin expressions, the examples usually occur in the character's dialogue, not in the narrator's discourse. 
In contrast to the Adice passage, the following is a sample of academic writing produced recently by a doctoral student in Nigeria. Cooperative principle, as propounded by Herbert Paul Grice, is an aspect of communicative principle which together with intention, cooperation and relevance are all responsible for communication action in a concrete context. For communication to be felicitous, interlocutors in discourse must share a set of mental states which are broadly emotional and cognitive in nature. The non-use of the definite article before the words cooperative and communicative suggests that the text was written by someone from an ESL country. But generally and undeniably the grammar and choice of words are felicitous and they are characteristic of academic writing. This has to be said, but it seems to have become unfashionable to say it. The set of DNFs contains both errors and legitimate variants. Jowett, 1991. This issue is related in turn to the question whether we should speak of a monolithic Nigerian English always, of course, to be distinguished from pidgin, or whether we can identify sub-varieties, often confusingly called varieties, of Nigerian English. Various schemas of sub-varieties have been proposed during the past 60 years or more. Jewett, 2022, speaks of ethnic and educational parameters that might differentiate them. The ethnic parameter has been little employed, except in the area of phonology, where Jibril 1982 remains a monumental but isolated work. Hence, it remains unclear whether DNFs in the areas of lexis and morphosyntax are used by all Nigerians, or whether usage in these areas differs according to ethnicity. This remains another area of Nigerian English requiring more research. The schemas referred to above have all been based essentially on the educational parameter. A major criticism of them is that Generally, their particular linguistic forms have not been specified and no procedure has been established for assigning a particular form to one variety or another. For example, we have no way of deciding, apart from instant judgment, whether the expression meet one's absence, long established in Nigerian usage and listed in the Dictionary of Ibuanusi 2002 belongs to variety 1 or variety 2 or variety 3. Doubt, at least, must therefore arise as to whether the sub-varieties have a real foundation. However, unless we are to regard Nigerian English as monolithic, we must at least contrast more educated with less educated usage, which can, to some extent, be correlated with a standard versus non-standard distinction or an acrolectal versus non-acrolectal distinction. The issue of errors versus variants is also related to the question whether there exists or might exist something we would like to call standard Nigerian English. That is not, 
or would not be identical to standard British English. The great problem is that what we may call divided usage, a neutral expression, is found in the English of educated Nigerians, or we might want to say the Nigerian English acrolect or variety three. Here are a few rather obvious examples. First, some people will say or write, can be able, others is or are able. Secondly, a low front monothong, a, is used by some people as the vowel of the first syllable of capable or Cambridge. In other words, we will hear capable or Cambridge, so that there's the possibility here of either using a monothong, a, or a diphthong, a. Thirdly, the word severally may mean several times, or it may mean one by one. At present, controversies over these and numerous other DNFs are resolved ultimately by recourse to general dictionaries and grammars. Usually, these are published outside Nigeria. However, severally, with the first meaning above, that is several times, is one of nearly 30 Nigerian English words recently added to the Oxford English Dictionary. This sketch so far of Nigerian English has laid emphasis on DNFs, that is separate individual linguistic forms that are produced by Nigerians in their speaking and writing. Identifying and list listing them and publishing them has engaged the attention of several scholars over the years, especially the writers of dictionaries or glossaries. Kujore, Odumu, Jurit, Ibuanusi, Blench, Okoro, Degwite et al. A, comprehens a comprehensive account would by no means be confined to specifying the distinctive forms of Nigerian English, however. Other issues that have been investigated or require further investigation include formality versus informality, the popularity of certain registers, such as that of religion, pragmatic strategies, such as politeness, and code switching and code mixing. There is also the issue of the comparatively restricted use of certain forms. Again, a fact which we are today perhaps somewhat reluctant to discuss because we may find ourselves wanting to use negative sounding words such as deficit. In the area of vocabulary, for example, it seems likely to prove true that a large number of monosyllabic English words occurring in registers concerned with practical matters of everyday life are hardly used or are not known. Thus, when four young people were asked recently to give the meaning of 50 such words, a few examples being fray, pair, P-A-R-E, rove, chuck, rud. The highest score of the three graduates tested was 21. It was the one undergraduate who scored 26. This does not necessarily mean that the English of the four young people could be described as impoverished. They probably all count as native speakers of English and generally all display a high degree of fluency and accuracy in their speech. 
and this judgment is not altered by the fact that during the exercise one of them said I must just go to the kitchen I have something on fire. This well justified positive assessment of course also applies to the slightly flawed second of the written texts discussed above. Third section Nigerian English and the dynamic model. Nigerian English can now be explicitly related to Schneider's dynamic model and vice versa. <clears throat> First, concerning the model's STL strand and the extent to which it is discernible in Nigerian English. As already said, Nigeria was never an area of white settlement so that in Nigeria there were no settlers to provide an STL strand. However, it seems that Schneider himself, for the sake of preserving the unity and applicability of his model, is ready to extend the meaning of settlers and STL strand. Thus, in Nigeria, settlers can be taken to mean the white, mainly British personnel who were present in the country for shorter or longer periods of time especially during the colonial era. They must have been the principal exponents of the exonormative standard. This naturally held unchallenged sway at that time. But into it, in their usage of it, Nigerians were probably at an early date introducing the IDG, indigenous elements. But when we have Nigeria in mind, many of Schneider's references to the STL strand read very strangely. Thus, where the identity construction component of the model is concerned, settlers in a colony such as Australia began to identify Australia rather than Britain as home, and increasingly regarded the Australian English that was taking shape rather than British English as a variety they could be they could be proud of and regard as theirs. This did not happen in Nigeria. The British personnel of the pre-1960 era did not regard Nigeria as home. They mostly left the country at or soon after independence and they did not regard most elements of Nigerian English that were entering the standard English used by Nigerians as acceptable. Again, owing to Schneider's desire to embrace in one model settler Englishes in ENL countries and in the narrower sense post-colonial Englishes in ESL countries, his account of the five phases of a variety's evolution often reads strangely. Phase one, foundation, naturally refers to both situations. Phase two, however, exonormative stabilization, refers to Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and above all to the USA, but it is difficult to see how it applies to Nigeria. For in the model, the English stabilised in this phase was that of settlers in what are now ENL countries who originally spoke various English dialects. In Nigeria, however, an ESL country, Nigerians were only beginning to learn English and the question of whether the variety of English they learned was a stable one or not is irrelevant. In contrast, phase three, nativization, is obviously applicable to Nigeria, Ghana, India and other ESL countries, while in contrast it seems inapplicable to the USA, Australia, Canada, etc. 
their varieties have acquired local characteristics or incorporated some indigenous elements, but have not been nativized in the same way or in the conspicuous way that English in Nigeria has been. Schneider believes that Nigeria has progressed deeply into phase three, but he does not say that the end of it has been reached. Phases four and five, endonormative stabilization and differentiation respectively, are applicable to ENL countries and are potentially applicable to ESL countries. Schneider's opinion is that there are signs that Nigeria is moving into phase four, but somewhat shakily. While endonormative stabilization has not yet been reached, but it may be just around the corner. Ugoji, 2015 and Ugwani 2022 take a different view. They maintain that Nigeria has already reached phase four. Ugoji, by proposing that phases four and five should be combined, in effect believes that it has also reached phase five. Ugwani also seeks to give dates for each of the five phases, suggesting that phase one lasted from the mid 19th to the early 20th century. Phase two began in 1914 with the merging of Northern and Southern Nigeria. Phase three began in the 1940s when the nationalist movement got into its stride. Phase four, began with the coming of independence and he does not venture to give a date for the beginning of phase five. Setting dates for the phases with any kind of precision is nevertheless a hazardous undertaking. To form an opinion on these important issues, it is important to take a closer look at the details of phases four and five. In phase four, according to Schneider, the citizens of a country are now fully conscious of themselves as a new nation and ethnic attachments are less important to them. The new nation demonstrates literary creativity. The expression X English is confidently used instead of English in X. The new variety is, hem is homo homogenized, that is, it is understood to be a single unified variety. And above all, the new variety is codified with the publication of dictionaries. Schneider does not say, though his specifications of this phase imply as much, that it is in phase four that the standard or norm for the variety is taken to be found not outside but inside the country is endonormative. The principal development of phase five, the details of which are otherwise not very clear, is the differentiation of dialects within the variety. We discuss these developments and their applicability to Nigeria in turn as follows. A, the use of X English. B, literary creativity. C, homogenization. D, codification. E, differentiation of dialects. With regard to A, the expression Nigerian English has come into widespread use in the post-independence era, although there are many Nigerians who continue to deprecate it and are skeptical about the existence of Nigerian English or confuse it 
with pigeon. With regard to B, Nigeria has, chiefly in the post-independence era, produced a number of novelists, dramatists and poets writing in English and tending to reflect Nigerian social realities in their work, and some of them have achieved international renown. As pointed out above, however, if DNFs appear in the work of the novelists, it is usually in the narrator's discourse, not in the character's dialogue. With regard to C, the question of homogenization, it is difficult to see how the Nigerian variety of English can be said to have become homogenized in phase four. If it is homogenized, it was surely already homogenized in phase three or earlier. If not, the lack of homogenization was probably there from the beginning. As stated earlier, however, there is a paucity of studies of possible ethnicity-based sub-varieties of Nigerian English, while the essentially education-based varieties have not been clearly defined. These facts serve to render C and E inapplicable to Nigeria. With regard to D, codification, this seems to be the most important feature of phase four, since it is above all through the publication of a reputable dictionary that a post-colonial English in any sense can be said to have achieved endonormative stabilization. As already mentioned, Nigeria has since the 1980s witnessed the publication of several dictionaries or glossaries of Nigerian English. These are, however, dictionaries of its distinctive English forms, its DNFs, which, as pointed out above, occur more in speech than in writing. They are therefore not dictionaries of standard Nigerian English, an expression which Okoro, for one, is reluctant to use. Each of the dictionaries has its limitations, Okoro's because it is only the first volume of a projected two-volume work. It is also difficult to say what the calls for standardization or codification are really aiming at. To take two more examples, would codification lead to regarding the omission of the definite article in the extract above as acceptable and prescribable? Or would the kind of relative clause that features in the following sentence taken from ICE Nigeria International Corpus of English, Nigeria, be acceptable? I'm very sorry for delaying the reply to your letter, of which I know that you have forgiven me. It seems justifiable to maintain that on the crucial criterion of linguistic forms, Nigerian English has not yet moved to phases four and five. Conclusion. This paper has shown that Schneider's dynamic model is to a considerable extent applicable to Nigeria and to Nigerian English, especially where his specifications of phase three are concerned. His general picture of the trajectory of the evolution of a new, a new variety of English and of Nigerian English in particular, is convincing. On the other hand, the paper has asserted that his phase two is not really applicable to Nigeria and other ESL countries, 
and it has implied that phases and two, 1 and 2 could be combined. It differs from Ugoji 2015 and Ugwani 2022 in maintaining that Nigerian English has not yet reached phases 4 and 5. Above all, the article reasserts the claim which puts a question mark over the model in general that there is a radical difference between the new varieties of English that developed in what were originally colonies of settlement such as the USA and Australia and those that have developed in ESL countries such as Nigeria and India. India is a, is a case of special interest deserving comparison with Nigeria because Indians have been learning English in a formal setting since the early years of the 19th century, earlier than Nigeria. Indians began writing in English in the late 18th century, before Nigerians, if we exclude the work of Olauda Equiano, and India attained independence before Nigeria. Yet, the evolution of Indian English, in Schneider's view, has still not gone beyond phase three. This comparison provokes one final thought. To say that a variety has not reached a phase or has still not gone beyond a phase sounds negative. It may sound as if one is belittling or discrediting the variety, but it is only to be realistic. And at the same time, there remains this positive fact that Nigerian English, in both senses, is and will remain alive, vigorous and dynamic. Thank you.